This is a talk I gave in May 2020 to the Northern Underwater Photography Group of the UK. Um, they asked me to give a talk about my career as an underwater photographer. And while I have included some sort of comments about how I got going in underwater photography, the main theme of this talk was an appreciation of our audience as a photographer and how understanding who you're shooting for can have a big impact on the type of images you, you, you take. Um, I think I'd like to sort of start by, by saying hello and, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak. You all look well and I hope you are all well and safe um, in these unusual and, and unprecedented times. I have seen quite a lot of these remote seminars recently and I think that um, I think that they're, they're, they're absolutely great, but they are a new experience both for audiences and for speakers, um, I guess part of our, our new normal. Um, Obviously, there are positives to, to, to having presentations like this. We can obviously still have meetings like this. I'm still able to, to, to speak and show my stuff, which is, which is really great. And talks can be recorded and saved and broadcast um, wi widely. Um, they can be watched live from, from all over the place. And they exist then for years to come as well. So actually, some of the talks that people are actually doing at the moment, I think will, uh, will, will go down and become a really useful resource for photographers going forward. I was joking with a couple of friends of mine that actually underwater photography books probably aren't going to sell very well anymore because there's going to be so much content available on YouTube and things after this period with, with every, everyone recording really interesting um, thoughts and about underwater photography. And I hope this is one of them. And there have been some really great presentations online over the last couple of months if you've had a chance to look for them. Um, two of the streams I'd recommend trying to find. Ocean Geographic have done a lot of of seminars and they've got some really good names in from time to time to talk on those and the guys at underwater tribe have also been doing regular ones online and both of those feeds are really worth checking out they've had some really good guests and and and, and both have a slightly different style so that they're really interesting to see um there are negatives of course um first of all i, I missed out on the gurkha grill which was i think my main reason for for agreeing to come up and talk but i did uh, myself cook a curry specially tonight it was uh, all the vegetables left in the fridge on a Monday night curry special. So it wasn't quite up to the standards of Gurkha Grill. But anyway, I did get to enjoy a curry this evening. Um, as we get to grips with this new technology, I think one of the lessons we've learned about social distance speaking is that it can be hard to give those detailed technical talks without actually being able to see the audience. I'm standing here just talking to a computer screen. And I think when you want to explain technical things, you really need to see the whites of the eyes of the audience. Well, or at least the, the, the eyelids of the eyes of the audience to see if people are sort of there, sort of going, hurry up, idiot, we know all this already. Or they're going, wait, hang on a minute, we haven't got a clue what you're talking about. And I, so I think one of the things I'm trying to do with my talks that go online is maybe talk in a slightly different style and, and, and perhaps talk in a more conversational way about underwater photography. And what's great tonight is I think it's encouraged me to find a really unusual topic to talk about. So as I was saying, tonight's talk is, is part autobiographical. That's what I agreed to talk about. And I'm going to sort of try and showcase some early images of mine, mine and some of the lessons I learned in my career. I particularly want to focus on the start of my career. I think whenever I tend to talk about what I do, I tend to talk about what I've been doing recently. As a photographer, you tend to, everything else kind of disappears into the into the murks of time. But I, I went back and had a real think about the thought process I was going through in those formative years, because actually that's really the bit that's of more interest really to people, is how, how I kind of made that transition from doing this to fun to doing it as a career. And it certainly wasn't one thing that launched me. It was definitely, I chipped away at things. I didn't have some grand master plan when I started. And if it sounds a little bit like that, that's probably more the benefit of hindsight and actually just putting things in an order now to make a good presentation that it maybe sounds a bit more organized. Obviously I had thoughts about where I wanted my photography to go, both in terms of the content of the photography and, and as a career, but um, you know, opportunities arise and you follow them and it's not all, all planned out the way it may sound. But I do hope that that hindsight is helpful perhaps to, to others who are thinking of exploring different things, whether in a small way or in a big way like I did. And I hope you enjoy seeing new images. I've tried to put in either pictures that I've taken in the last 12 months that maybe you haven't seen before. Um, or I've put in pictures from those good old days that, that in, when I was kind of transitioning from amateur to pro in the first couple of years of, of trying to make this work for, as a living. 
So not all the pictures in this talk, I would say, are really up to date, and many of them have been superseded both by myself and others, but they're pictures, a lot of them are pictures that are really important to me and maybe started what I feel like a, 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 a sub-genre or a genre within underwater photography. In addition to talking about myself, I plan to sort of weave some teaching, some, some thought process that you can take away through this kind of like a, a motif. Um, and that is on the subject of appreciating the audience for our pictures and how that can really influence as a, as a photographer, which I think is a really interesting area. I've bookended this talk with, with two quotes from Ansel Adams, the, the great American landscape photographer. The first one, I'll, I'll read it out. I'm sure you can all read it there. But um, there were always two people in every picture, the photographer and the viewer. And I think Adams' quote is, is often used, and it's, it's certainly intended, to encourage photographers to make their pictures their own, to actually put something of themselves, something of their own personality, their own individuality, into the way they shoot a subject. But I want to take it tonight and talk about the, the final line of that there, the viewer, um, and, uh, and make us think a little bit more about who we're thinking for, who we're shooting for. I think this question, who we're shooting for, is one that I've never really heard underwater photographers discuss before. And so I thought it was a really rich theme um, to pick into tonight to create a slightly different talk. The, the absolutely, perhaps the most important message in the whole talk, but the first answer to who we are shooting for is absolutely ourselves. And I love this activity. I have from when I first started and I still love it today. I love the, the lusting after the gear, uh, fettling and putting it all together pre-dive. I love going underwater the weightlessness, the freedom, the adventure, the exploration, wondering what I might encounter next. Those who've been diving with me will know that my, my enthusiasm for diving um, burns very brightly still. Even when it's diving some place where I run workshops every single year, maybe a reef in the Cayman Islands or a wreck in the Red Sea that I'm diving for the hundredth time, I'll still be leaping into the water full of excitement about what I, I, can, I can do when I'm down there. I also really love the, the process of taking photos, the technical challenge, the artistic expression of it, the creating. Um, I quite simply, I guess, like being underwater and I like clicking my shutter and seeing what I can produce. And I'm sure lots of you um, uh, share exactly those feelings and many more indeed about this activity. And I'm sure that's, that's why people are watching this watching tonight. But beyond this, most of us hope and intend that our photos aren't just for ourselves, but are seen by more people than just, just us. We love taking pictures, but it's even great to be able to show them to other people. And particularly for me, when underwater photography became my career, which is now more than 15 years ago, I definitely had to think much more about who else I was shooting for, because you certainly don't earn any money taking pictures for yourself. Um, so I definitely always create images for me, the photographer, but I it's also, for me, was really important to think about who was my viewer? And the different viewers I thought about really influenced my photography. So the reason why I think this is a really interesting to talk about tonight um, is that I want to encourage you to, to think about who you're shooting for as well. Because for me, it certainly improved my photography doing so. I think perhaps the most important message I have in all of this is that there's absolutely no right answer to that question. Normally, when I talk, about technical things, you know, there's a clear right and wrong way to do things. If you want to take a split level of a crocodile like this and you shoot a full frame camera like me, you really want your aperture to be at f20, you want to focus underwater, use that small aperture to keep everything sharp in the frame. There's a clear technical best way of doing things. But I think in this aspect of, of underwater photography, this discussion about audience, there is no right answer. And we can change our answer to who our audience, our intended audience for our pictures is all the time. And that change changes the way we shoot a subject and that can be really good for our photography. In fact, um, I think this can really drive diversity in our work. It can drive us to work in different directions, to broaden our skills and to, to diversify our portfolio. But perhaps the most valuable thing of all is simply to think about your audience and allow it to guide your photography. And I bet actually a lot of you are already doing this, maybe subconsciously, if you've never really sort of thought about it before. But when you take pictures, you're thinking, oh, yes, I'd like to this to, to, to show to whoever. And I, th I think this is something that certainly authors do all the time. You know, when someone's sort of learning to write, you know, whether it's um, you know, particularly fiction, they're often told to tell a story, tell their story to one individual, to have a person in mind. 
And this isn't because they want to sell their book to just one person. But I think that having that that viewer, that reader in that reader, that viewer in mind for our work gives a direction to our creativity, gives it a focus. And it's exactly the same for photography. By considering our audience, it makes making those decisions about our photographs easier. And it drives us to create greater finesse because we've got a clear direction. It drives our photos to, be to greater heights. Thinking about one type of audience, say, say a reader of a dive magazine, will make me want to shoot a picture of a frogfish in a very different way to maybe another. So here, for example, I wanted to take a wide angle scene to show this amazing weird fish and how it lives its life in its, its very specialised habitat. If I think about a different viewer, I might shoot the fish in a completely different way. This picture was taken on the same trip, but this was taken much more perhaps thinking about another underwater photographer being my prime viewer. Here, I'm, I'm, I really want to, you know, to, to, to create a much more interpretive, much more creative trip um, picture that would pull someone in. So I think before we go into all of this, I want to stress that there's no right or wrong answers. Just, just a realisation that shooting for different viewers is likely to take us down totally different photographic paths with the subject. And that can be really good for our photography. Another valuable lesson is to never underestimate that audience. We shouldn't dumb down our photographic vision or underrate, under, underrate the sophistication of, of their visual tastes. Almost every single human I've met, whether they know nothing about photography or not, will react totally differently when you show them a completely stunning image to a fairly mediocre one. And I've always felt that the, the public, the people who sort of consume our images in general, even if they have no specialist knowledge, have a, a really strong collective memory for what they've seen before and what is visually fresh, visually new, visually surprising. And I know which one is the one that will really pull them in and make them want to look at our work. So who is our viewer? Who, who is our audience? Um, and there are, of course, loads of answers to that. I think a lot of us, as well as shooting for ourselves, are going to want to shoot perhaps for our partner, showing them maybe what we saw on our dives, or um, if, if they came diving with us, show them to record some of the experiences that we shared. This is a picture of my, my wife here with a, with a whale shark. But I think that a, a, lot, a lot of us, the audience that we're thinking of as photographers, are other photographers. And actually, I think this has been a really valuable thing for my work and has driven my work, work forward. And it's something that I've done a lot in the past is really think that when I'm shooting, yeah, I'm trying to create the best picture to impress my photographic mates. And I think this motivation to impress our peers is, is really strong and it drives us to excellence. And it particularly drives us to push those boundaries back. I think the downside is that it can drive us down a bit of a cul-de-sac in terms of the wider appeal of our work because we're trying to pander too much to that crowd. Although I have to say many of my favourite images were taken very much with my underwater photography peers in mind as, as the main audience for them. These peers might be like, like each other here at meetings or particularly these days, they're often our peers on social media. And I think perhaps shooting pictures that'll do, that'll have the effect we want on social media is something that is perhaps the, the main audience that a lot of photographers that, that I meet are shooting for a, a lot of the time. And, and yes, there's lots of pluses and minuses about that. And it is very easy to be dismissive about this. I'm sure you've heard lots of photographers, probably even me, talking about things like Instagram crops. You know, the fact that suggesting images perhaps need to be slightly dumbed down from their, but their, their full artistic um, um, value um, to work on, on, on a small iPhone screen. Cropped tightly, drained of their, 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 their artistry um, to work on a phone screen. I have to say social media, you know, like Instagram, is probably the best shop window and the best gallery that we, we photographers have these days. It's certainly the most viewed. Um, so it's something that we shouldn't completely dismiss or look down our noses at. The key with social media is to keep it in its box, is not to become obsessed, obsessed about what you share um, and don't just share what you think will get the most likes. Because the one thing I know about social media is it really isn't what you share it's it's who shares it and who's got the biggest following in the first place you know it's a pretty straight line if you plot the the number of likes a picture gets on any social media relative to the number of followers that person has so it has relatively little difference um you know when big this this picture here on the the left um is is um discovery um tweeting a picture of my sorry on instagram sharing a picture of mine 
um, which has been shared gazillions of times by gazillions of outlets. And, you know, th- here they got like half a million likes in less than less than 24 hours. If, if, if I share that, that, that picture on my account, it might get a, a, a thousand or so likes. If I give the picture to a friend of mine who's got a, a really small account and they share the same picture, it'll get 10 likes. So, you know, it's nothing to do with the quality of the work. It's simply to do with the engagement of the, the accounts. Um, so don't get, get too carried away by, by that sort of thing. I think another audience that a lot of us are thinking about when we're shooting is competition judges. Um, and occasionally this can work perfectly, but most of the time I think it works really badly. And I'm going to start with an example where it actually did work for me. I think it's probably the only time it's worked for me. Um, these um, mating shy hamlets won for me in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year and are probably the only example I can think of as a picture that I really had a competition in mind when I was shooting it. I think that was partly because I'd already been doing a big long project on Hamlets and I'd taken lots and lots of shots of them and I kind of figured out exactly what would make the perfect image. And the main reason I was chasing that image at the time was was, was really for competitions. And I, I really wanted to win in the Wildlife Photographer. I hadn't when I took this picture. And this was the first picture I took that was awarded in the Wildlife Photographer. Um, but I knew exactly what I wanted to get it right. I needed the right species, the prettiest species. I needed exactly the right pose in the mating to show the mating, but also the most photogenic pose of the fish. And I needed the right background. I needed that clean background. There was a lot going on. When I finally got that picture, I, I surfaced from this particular dive. And although I could only see this picture on the tiny postage stamp screen on the back of my D100 camera that I was using back in, in 2003, I knew right then, or I, I mean, I remember saying on the boat right then, that this will get me to the, the Natural History Museum. And it's the only time, for the record, it's the only time I've ever said that after a dive, before or, or, or since. And fortunately for me, in that case, it, it was it actually did come true. But while shooting for contents, contests is an excellent, excellent incentive to push our photography to new heights and to encourage us to find these fresh perspectives, the math shows of competitions that most pictures that are entered don't win. And probably most of those people were thinking about competitions. So photo, you know, just, just if you think of the numbers, photo contests get thousands of entries and they award just a few. So measuring your photography by its success in this realm is always going to leave you disappointed most of the time. And if you don't accept those odds when you go into it, you can end up, as, as, as several photographers have done, very bitter, very twisted, very jealous um, about all these things that are going on. So I think that's a major downside of making competitions too much of a focus about what you're trying to do as an underwater photographer. If there is any sort of recipe for success, it's in competitions, it's to stand out by being different, by being yourself. This, this seal um, was a, a double category winner in the British Wildlife Photography Awards last year. And I absolutely don't believe it's any better than you know, as a, as a photograph in isolation, any better than any other British seal shot, particularly that I've seen. But it's very diff- different from the typical seal on a dome shots that most of us have taken many, many times. And I think it's that diff- being different, being original, that actually allowed it to stand out in the competition. This shot, you know, gets very widely published. And I know lots of people in the, uh, um, will have shots similar to this, uh, maybe of younger seals. It's quite unusual to have this with an old seal with rotten teeth but usually young pups playing on the dome. Um, but this picture's never won a prize because it's probably just too similar to what everyone is doing. I think just want to talk about contests. I think my fa- this picture here is my favourite contest winner. Um, and I like it not only because it won really big for me, but also because it, it felt a totally original underwater picture at the time. And there's nothing better than having a really big one in a competition with a picture that's really yours and it's not just a variation of a shot someone else has done at some point in the past. Um, I'd not seen another photo like this when I took it. It's a, to, to explain it for those who have not, haven't seen this picture before, it's a four second exposure, so a long exposure taken at night of jacks um, hunting, swimming around a coral head on, on a coral reef. And the long exposure has blurred the hunting jacks into trails. It's kind of... A very specific arty picture. Um, I remember when I took this picture, I shared it with a, a magazine editor I we worked with at the time. They hated it, um, and actually that stopped me entering it into competitions the first year I took it. Um, but I, um, I, I lost my faith in in that it was something interesting. But I did in the end enter it, and it, and it won big for me. 
Um, but it was very much a picture that I didn't take with competitions in mind. I took it for myself. I was just enjoying experimenting with my camera on a tripod at night, trying new ideas, seeing different things, reacting to what I was getting and, and tweaking things to get better and better results. Um, it was only after the, the trip that I, I, I sort of really focused in on these pictures. And I think the lesson for me is if you want those comp competition wins, focus on your photography and don't focus on trying to create a contest picture. As a competition judge, the most common mistake I see in entries for competitions is photographers trying to follow the latest fashions. And the most common reason that most shots fail is because they end up in that we've seen it before file. And that's usually because they're just a year or two too late. Someone's already been in that, you know, got their foot in that door and got that shot. Um, most, most of the pictures actually that you get the second year after a great idea comes out are often much better than the picture that was awarded. And that's why people put them in. They're like, oh, I've got a shot like that winner from last year and mine's even better. I'll put it in. But unfortunately, it's lost that originality cachet and that can stop it winning in the really, really big competition. And it can end up in the, the photocopier's file. That said, I think there's a really fine line between imitation and inspiration when it comes to creating our pictures. And it's a line that we have to skirt. All photographers are inspired by other people's work and it's really important to be out there looking at pictures both within our genre and, and outside of it. Um, and I think that the quote that I, I put in my book, it's from um, Salvador Dali, the, the great, great creative genius, um, is that, you know, his quote was, those, I've got to read this out, those who do not want to imitate anything produce nothing. So if even Salvador Dali was imitating and, and absorbing inspiration from everyone else, then I think we all can can make that part of our photography. The trick though is to absorb those ideas, but not to copy pictures directly. Um, this photo here of an Anthias shot against sunlight bokeh, um, created by the setting sun underwater, was inspired as, as, as a kind of a direct copy of pictures that nature photographers were doing on land with flowers and birds around water on land um, and the sun reflecting on the water. And I was just trying to, to recreate that effect under, underwater and it, and it created some original images. Not that they ever won any contest. This talk was supposed to be autobiographical. So um, I wanted to, to, to talk about my early years as a photographer. Now, I started underwater photography as a kid. Um, and I was growing up absolutely mad keen on marine life, particularly fish life. And, I, and I, to be honest, I still am. Um, and the other sort of big influence on me was that none of my family dived. None of them really even liked to snorkel. So it was kind of, this is something I really did on my own. And I think those motivations to record all the animals I was interested in and to be able to share them with my, my non-diving family. That was my early audience as a photographer. But as I wanted to create stronger images growing up, I was motivated very much to reproduce the style of pictures that I saw in, in books and magazines, which in those pre-internet days were the only, only source of, of, of visual inspiration you could really find. And I was still at school when I took this picture. And it's just, a, it's a very classic underwater photography picture but um, all this picture and all the following ones are all taken with the Nikonos 5 camera and a 15 millimeter lens. And it was very good at taking this type of picture where you'd set your focus at a certain distance, find a foreground subject, get a diver behind it um, and, and light it up with your, your light the whole scene up with your single flash gun. But perhaps not that, that, that creative a picture. I'm quite proud to say that I was still experimenting with my photography at that time taking pictures for, for myself as well. And, and clearly it must have been in my mind to, uh, to in, impress others. That must have been you know, why I was willing to experiment. This is a picture taken also when I was at school on the same trip as the other one, probably a dive or two later, because I didn't do many dives in those days, of a nurse shark inside a cave. And I've actually held my, my, my strobe off camera to light inside the cave and have this um, non-lit foreground, which I think looks, looks really cool. And I think that shows my mind was clearly going in interesting directions, even if I didn't really know what I was doing. As I developed as a photographer, I became interested in improving my worth in photo contests. And this was one of my early photographic successes in a photographic competition. And this won in the Young Amateur Photographer of the Year competition um, sometime in the 90s. And I remember, in the early 90s it must have been, and I remember having to take time off school to go up to London during the, the daytime to when they had the award ceremony kind of over lunch in the, in the, in the magazine offices in London. It was all, all very exciting. I was very nervous. Anyway, I think one of the things I learned from that was that the judges never pick the, the picture that you love. 
this was my favourite picture that I entered into that competition. And I thought this was much more creative. In fact, I'd, I'd put the diver and the moray eel shot in to show that I could do the basics really, really well. That was kind of, for me, that's a classic shot. But for a competition, I need to go further than that. And I entered this long exposure of convict tangs moving across the reef. It was taken while snorkeling. I did a lot of photography snorkeling in those days because I couldn't afford to do, or my, I couldn't afford to beg my parents to pay for me to do many dives um, when I was still at school. So I used to do all of my photography snorkeling and this was playing around with, with long exposures while doing that. And I love this picture much more. I thought it was much more interesting. And I have to say, visually, I still do now. So obviously had some good, good senses. But that competition success in bits and pieces here and there definitely raised my stock, my stock, sorry. And um, and definitely people around the British photography, underwater photography community started to notice my work. And most of the time I was trying to balance this being innovative with take, taking high quality shots. But unfortunately, most of the time in those days, I used to achieve one or the other in, in, in an image. So I'd take a creative shot that wasn't quite there technically. Or I'd take a classic style shot that was kind of spot on technically, but artistically pretty dull. And I think the other thing in those days is it was really hard to get advice. There was, you know, it was much harder to meet other underwater photographers. Um, I think all these pictures were taken before I'd ever met another active British underwater photographers. And they were taken sort of, you know, four or five years before I even knew just bee soup existed. Because, you know, just that information was just, if you knew the right people, it, you, you know, obviously everyone was talking about it, but I just didn't know the right people. During my university years, I started getting invites to publish my work occasionally and to present my work. Um, I still had pretty limited diving opportunities for financial reasons and a fairly limited portfolio. So when I was asked to speak, the way I positioned myself is I didn't want to sort of be compared like with like with big established photographers who were traveling all around the world. So I'd always let myself be pigeonholed and, and, and partly that sort of allowed me to get known as a specialist and partly avoided those direct comparisons with the kind of the big guns of the era. And I think key in the British underwater photography calendar at that time in the kind of fun um, was the, the Visions in the Sea conference, which I think was started in 97 um, by Steve Warren of, of Ocean Optics. And in fact, Nick and Caroline won, ran one of the best ones up in Manchester in 2009. And it ran every year through that period. So it ran for really quite a long time. And it was really the focal point of the year. People would shoot all year, ready to present their work. And the first time I spoke there, you know, very much wanted to present my work. Um, I was in my, you know, my early 20s when I first spoke. And I definitely played up my marine biologist credentials, trying to, you know, showing off images of, 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 of interesting behaviours that other people didn't have. And it was my way of making my work stand out without having to be compared to the people who've been all around the world and seen all the great things. This is a pair of, of rock beauty angelfish mating. This is a more recent image than, than, than that time. It's a picture I've taken probably in the last 10 years. The next time I was invited back to speak, I decided I would totally change track tack and, mar and present myself, market myself in a completely different way. Um, and because I wasn't able to dive much in those days, I used to do a lot of photography snorkeling. And because there wasn't so many different things to shoot, I tried lots and lots of experiments playing with light in shallow water, with reflections, with split levels, long exposures. I'd take pictures inside waves and more and more. And I did a whole talk on that. And I think that was really interesting that I suddenly everyone kind of had pigeonholed me as this sort of marine biology photographer who took really interesting but not particularly beautiful pictures. And then suddenly I was showing these beautiful, creative, grand, you know, very fresh, different images. And I think that really definitely enhanced my, my reputation in the underwater photography community. I was awarded my PhD at the end of the 1990s and started to actually earn some income working as a postdoc, not a great deal, but some. And this finally allowed me the chance to travel under my own steam, to dive more and, and to shoot more. With these pictures, I was able to add a lot of international contest success. I didn't do underwater photography contests for many years, but during that period, I had a lot of success. And particularly at the, the Antibes Festival, which doesn't really exist anymore, but it was very much the, the top underwater photography competition of the day. And as I would say, the, the underwater photographer of the year competition um, of those days. Um, and there'd actually been very, very little British success for about two decades. It was like, it'd become like this joke in Bee Soup that, oh, this competition never awards the British photographers. They hate all the Brits and everything. Um, and this picture, which, which I shot on, on film in, I think um, one in 2001 there. Um, and I was actually attending the festival because it was a great chance to meet other underwater photographers. 
but I didn't actually bother going to the prize giving ceremony just because I just never assumed that I, I would win. I was just happy to be part of it. And actually that evening I won four awards and I was sitting in a bar outside the award ceremony while my name was being read out again and again. Um, but I think the fact that I wasn't there actually really got my name around because it kind of became a joke in the room that I wasn't there. Um, so if I'd been there, I'd have just gone up on stage and everyone would have forgotten about me. So I think it probably worked out for the best in the end. But it was a real breakthrough career wise for me. I think I was fortuitous that there hadn't been a lot of British success. And so at the time, the British community and the British, me British diving media made a lot of song and dance about it. And my first book commission and a big healthy advance that I really needed at the time came ex directly on the back of, of my success in on team. Um, and that was that was that was really exciting. Um, I think the big competitions remain incredibly valuable to the, for this. The smaller competitions, less so. The media only watches the big few. But the small ones are great for pricking up prizes, for getting experience, and also for getting awards that the judges in the big competitions was too stupid to realise were brilliant. So I'm not against the smaller competitions, but really you know, put your effort into the big ones. And so um, and for me, um, I was fortunate that within a couple of years of this, I was soon re winning regularly in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year. And that just takes your le takes your work and the opportunities to a whole nother level. Really is just, just incomparable as, as a photographer to have success there. I think throughout this stage in my career, the thing that was driving me on was I really wanted my work to stand out from other photographers. I definitely wanted to make my mark in, in the field of underwater photography. And I was kind of most motivated. My audience in my mind was definitely my peers. My photography was really driven by wanting to create work that, st that simply stood out from what others were doing. And this picture here was taken on a shark trip in the Bahamas with lots of other photographers. And I was just drawn to, to take this shot because I wanted to be different from everyone else. And, and that definitely stood me in really good stead. Camera technology was fast sort of improving at this time. I definitely became really well known for taking single animal portraits, particularly these sort of head shots, head on shots, double eye contact shots, full of character. That, and, and these were made possible by the latest autofocus improvements. At that time, the cameras were going from basically autofocus that was borderline unusable to autofocus that was really quite good at following and tracking subjects, particularly if you were a good stable diver in, in the water. And I was using a Nikon D2X in the early 2000s. And that camera had much better autofocus than the cameras that had gone before it and all the, it, the other cameras that were around at the same time as it that a lot of other photographers were using. I was aware of this and I really wanted to play to the strengths of my camera to give me that sort of competitive edge. So I did a lot of this sort of portrait photography because I knew that my camera could do stuff. Although I have to say this particular shot, which is probably my best known shot from, from that era, was actually taken on a second camera, a crappy D80, if anyone remembers Nikon D80 from those days, because I had the D2X on the dive, but it had the wide angle on for this particular dive and I didn't wasn't intending to roll a macro. So there's an irony in that somewhere, I guess. I also did a lot of shooting using long exposures, usually by choice, choice but this picture actually wasn't. Um, on one of the wet pixel trips I was co-leading in, in 2006, my, my unreliable subtronic strobes that were always going wrong broke, but would still fire on full power. So for the whole trip, I had to shoot with my aperture closed right down and as a result, really slow shutter speeds. So I spent a whole trip shooting long exposure blur shots um, with, with, my, my, with my subtronic stuck on full power. Um, but actually it was really good because it actually meant that I really got on top of this technique at a time when others were doing it, but no one was really doing it. I think everyone was just trusting to luck. They'd dial in a slow exposure, probably use rear curtain sync and just blast away and, and enjoy the effects they got. And by having to do a whole trip of it, it really got me on top of the, of the technique. And, and, you know, I don't want to do too much too technical stuff tonight. But in short, if you're keeping the camera still, use rear curtain sync. And if you're moving the camera, move it slightly faster than the subject and use front curtain sync um, to get these sort of effects. And although I wasn't the originator of, of these, these shots, actually at the time, this, the, my, my, my American friends who were on all these wet pixel trips used to call these shots the British technique. Um, because, because you know, um, but it was actually I was shooting so many of them because of because of camera problems. I think a lot of I, I see a lot of fortune in the way cards fall, and and definitely serendipitously in this period, when I was breaking through into in underwater photography, it coincided with the rise of digital cameras, which really rewrote a lot of the rules in underwater photography. And I think many of the established photographers at the time didn't want to accept that, or maybe just stuck with film because it's what they knew. And, you know, to be honest, they just ended up stuck in the mud. 
on top of that the ones that did switch a lot of a lot of the the older pros just carried on shooting the same shots just on digital and i think perhaps some of the the newer photographers although have been 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 shooting underwater for a long time at this point but so the newer photographers who are willing to get excited about digi digital technology it really left the door open for us um, and the technology was sort of tailor-made for, for running away with it, as, as we all know, as we all shoot digital now. The image review meant that we could, you know, shoot and light with a new level of finesse to, to photography that done before. And the unlimited frame rate on a dive really, and, and, and new technology like white balance, adjustability, and, and some of the processing really sort of freed the creative shackles and really allowed us to push into new areas. At the time, I used to give a talk called Digital Thinking about how you know we could really break break free in our photography um i think one of the zeitgeist films of the era that i used to quote in the talk the matrix um there was a quote in there from from morpheus where he said you know some rules can be bent others can be broken and that was really the attitude i took into digital photography a lot of the rules of underwater photography that existed for years and years best practices this is the way to do it could be bent and others could be broken completely and this boha snapper shot that that you know had a lot of had you know there was a category winner in the wildlife photography, it was a very well-known picture, it was a real poster boy for that digital thinking talk and, and that, that period of my life of, of really promoting all the things digital could do. And it's a shot that you couldn't have taken on slide film. It was just taken through too much water. If you took this on slide film, it would just be all blue. But on digital, the ability to tweak the white balance, tweak the contrast a little bit, make the subject pop out, um, really made this shot possible. And it meant that at the time, those of us who were willing to accept what digital could do new. And in the early days of digital, there was not so many people doing that. A lot of people were just carrying on the same. We could create images that really looked different to the ones that had gone before. And they got loads of attention. You know, um, and you know, the judges of the wildlife photographer didn't know anything about how this picture was taken. They just reacted to, wow, I've never seen an underwater picture that looks like that. Great, winner. When I finally learned about B-Soup in the late 90s, I became a real nause for, for the history of underwater photography and its techniques. And I also was very proud that I got to dive in that period with a lot of the B-Suit royalty. The, the Doegs, the, the Williamses, the Rolands, the Pitkins of this world, and, and many more. But I particularly enjoyed diving with and learning from Peter Schoons, who was by then in his career shooting movies, not, not, not pictures, not still pictures. And Schoons was an absolute master on so many fronts, but he was absolutely unmatched in his knowledge of available light shooting underwater and really, really generous with that knowledge. And, it, and it, was, it was his work that really inspired me to emulate him in stills photography, developing filters for my SLR with, with Peter Rowlands, um, that became the magic filters, and taking the first manually white balanced um, underwater shots with SLRs. And actually that technique and obviously becoming you know, incredibly mainstream, primarily popularized initially through the Paddy Digital Underwater Photography Specialty, which um, I helped um, a, a, one of the, the active photographers at the time, Andy Voltz, um, right, he was the author of that specialty um, a, a few years after we developed the magic filter. A sort of another bit of digital thinking that I discovered completely by luck was that I was using subtronic flashes through this period, which weren't very reliable, but they had great light. And most other people were shooting with Japanese strobes. The subtronics had the advantage that they were really warm. On film, this didn't really make much of a difference. It just made your subject was a little bit warmer. But on digital, which none of us realized at the time, it, uh, with a camera that had auto white balance, it had a much bigger impact on the picture, particularly the background, the background watercolor. Um, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, and, um, but basically, you know, the theory is if you use cool strobes, the camera white balances on the subject to create the subject having the right color balance. And as a result, it has to warm the whole picture up and it makes the, the background water more greeny blue. So the blue doesn't look so good. If you use warm colored strobes, the camera has to, Look, the auto white balance on the camera looks at the subject, makes the subject neutrally coloured and has to cool the picture down so it makes the bluer, bluer blue. Tops in, so I was very fortunate that I just happened to have strobes that were making my blues great. And f it took for us a few years to really figure out what the hell was going on. People thought it was my camera. People were asking me exactly what exposures I was using and I was telling them because I wasn't really sure what was causing it. And then finally, it kind of dawned on me what was making perhaps the biggest difference was, you know, yes, I was taking care on exposures and, and angles and, and working with the sun and all those things that are really important. But I was also using these warm strobes. Actually, at the time, my blue, you know, many people used to call my blues mustard blue. It's kind of a bit of a uh, joke on words. It was sort of a phrase that was coined on wet pixel, but Martin Edge used it liberally through his fourth edition of his book. So it really stuck at that point. 
Um, and finally, we figured out what it was. Um, this sort of topsy turvy way of, of of thinking about about how light, how foreground light could affect the background color. Um, and you know, from that point on, strobe manufacturers started making warming gels for strobes or warming diffusers. I helped in on developing theirs. And and most photographers now who who you know, know what they're doing uh, are trying to shoot warm strobes in blue water for this advantage. And for me, this was the most exciting era ever in underwater photography that I've been involved in. These few years at the beginning of digital, um, the internet was sort of just up and running the, and the global community of underwater photographers really came together for the first time ever and were grappling with all this new digital camera technology and its capabilities. The community was really united in trying to figure things out and really united on forums like WetPixel, you know, DigiGreen in the UK, Digital Diver, um, you know, lo lots of really, you know, um, um, DigiDeep, you know, all these different places. Um, sharing, not everyone was really sharing knowledge openly in a way that didn't really ever happen before and hasn't, doesn't really happen these days. Um, people are much more, you know, careful about what they share. Um, and I think everyone involved in that bubble at the time, you know, was really trying to break down the walls in underwater photography, both with the gear and with our images. And everyone was really open about what they were trying and what they were learning. It was a really great time. It was, I mean, it was so exciting. You, you do some dives, try something new um, with, with, you know, with the digital technology, whether it was shooting available light or, 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 or playing with, with, with different features of the camera. And when you learned something, you'd sort of share it on the forums and tell other people, have a go, see what you think. And when, you know, you know friends like Eric Chang and James Wiseman and many, many more people, you know, hundreds of people made really valuable contributions during that period. And people would just go out and try things. And when they worked, you know, we'd write them up in articles on WetPixel or in, in Underwater Photography magazine. And it was, you know, really, really you know, fantastic, fantastic time for me. Um, and I guess a lot of those articles really helped also in generating my reputation and making this career possible for me. There was so much new stuff to learn and to sort out. And there was such a sharing vibe amongst all of us. Anyway, throughout most of this era, the audience that I had in mind for my pictures was very much other underwater photographers. I was always shooting pictures to impress other underwater photographers. And that was great for developing a career within our, our community and developing a reputation. But in 2004, I, I decided to make a big change in my life. I left my job in science and decided to to make underwater photography my job. And I don't need to tell you how little money I was making at times during that the early years of that. Um, but the need to earn money for my photography definitely changed my photography. And um, one of the early mental shifts I made was to consciously delay that sort of moment of elation, of satisfaction, of making a great image from the moment of actually taking it and seeing it come up on the screen to the moment of seeing it published. I think it, it really impressed on myself the need to get photos out there and get them earning. And I probably should have made it the moment the check actually arrived, but, but perhaps that's, that's just too long, long a wait for some of the publishers that are out there. The sort of the two people when I'm shooting, you know, for magazine type output, I'm thinking of are that sort of typical reader and, and the editor, both of whom vary a little bit with publications. One is the person who the pictures are really aimed for, the, the reader, and the other is the, the sort of doorman who's controlling who's coming in, as it were. Um, for example, in, in Dive magazine, the typical reader doesn't need to be spoon fed the basics about the underwater world. You can assume that they know subjects so you can show them in slightly more interpretive ways. And But you want to capture dives as they remember them, which are invariably the best bits of the reef or the most exciting encounters, reminding them why they love this sport. Editors want both eye catching and storytelling images to make their publications, make the features work. I've always seen myself more as a photographer than a photojournalist. But I've, I really enjoyed this challenge of trying to to tell, make these storytelling images, these narrative images and broaden my photography skills. And it was definitely a consuming challenge um, to take the reader to these places and clearly illustrate my feelings about the location through my work. And, and, and the other thing is that magazine you know, definitely you know, forced me to shoot more people pictures. I think there is a bit of a fallacy in underwater photography that the only images that sell um, have people in them. You know, all these covers here, and predominantly on diving magazines, none of these have people in them. So it's not really true, but there's no denying that learning to enjoy the challenge of shooting people is really valuable as in, in, in career type underwater photography, primarily because magazines want to use them, but also because a lot of underwater photographers don't want to shoot people shots. The number of even really established photographers who goes, oh, I don't like shooting people, I don't shoot people. You know, it just makes it easier for the people who do to sell their pictures.
I think another truism is, truism of professional photography is that the most valuable pictures aren't the ones that you already have taken or that you really want to take. They're the ones that don't yet exist, but some client really, really wants. Um, and often they're not particularly artistically exciting. So I've never really done lots of commissions during my career. Um, I think the era of that is slightly over as well. Um, but I do really enjoy them when they come along because they, they challenge me, I think, really well as a photographer. And a project I'm currently working on, um, these, these are all new images, is um, in the Cayman Islands where I'm taking documentary pictures of different dive sites there in a style that makes the diving look really inviting, but also makes the dive sites recognisable to people who know them and who dive on them. Plus, at the same time, they've got to have people in them. So it's quite a lot to manage. And while taking pictures that are moody, that have lots of shadow and darkness, are really attractive in the underwater world, for something like this, you know, the, the, the client wants bright, colourful, inviting images that make tourists want to go there and dive. You know, not every new diver wants to go in a dark cavern. So you need to make places look bright and inviting. I often sort of refer to this kind of photography when I'm, when I'm speaking to them as, as kind of rom-com lighting, if you, you've ever seen kind of, you know, so everything is bright and colourful and lit up like a, a, a New York office in a, a Nancy Myers movie or something like that. And while artistically these pictures do nothing to impress my peers, I actually find these incredibly satisfying to take. They, you know, they require teamwork between you and, and the dive team. There's a lot of time pressure on shooting them because you're trying to do a lot in a relatively short time. There's a real need for attention to detail in terms of, you know, and there's a lot of care has to be taken in terms of the, the composition, the, the costume of the model, the pose, the eye line, you know, lots and lots of little details need to come to come right for these to come around. So, and there's a, you really need a mastery of, of the technique of underwater photography to be able to shoot such big scenes underwater. It's not easy shooting really big scenes um, in the underwater world and lighting them up like this. But um, while a focus on images that, that, that sold, I think really helped me financially in my early pro-life, one of the problems of, of shooting for the man is that I felt that my work was suffering a little bit artistically. And around, I guess about 10 years ago now, I sort of recognised this, a sort of competition wins had dried up a little bit. I'd seen, and you know, and I've definitely seen this in the work of other people, they start doing stuff for magazines and then they, they just become a magazine star photographer. And so I made a little bit of a change in the way the way I was 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 doing things. And the big change that I made was I start stopped trying to write features for the magazines so much and concentrated much more about writing about photography, particularly doing monthly photography columns. And I'd written up to four um, some months every month for the last 10 years, which is a lot of words and pictures. But I think what it's given me is it's by writing about photography, inviting me to shoot what I like and experiment and create and then simply share the successful experiments, you know, with people and get paid. And also it was kind of a tweaking of the audience I had in my mind from being that sort of typical reader to being the typical keen photographer reader. Um, and that has really freed me up creatively to just shoot what I want and still get it published. To my last couple of slides now, uh, I'm, and I'm not going to bore you with the stuff that I've sort of done since then, since I got up and running. I think the interesting thing was to talk about how the various things that wove together to get me up and running. But these days, I'm definitely very conscious of my audience that I'm shooting for. And I have it in my mind. And I definitely like to change it around a bit to keep my portfolio fresh and diverse. In recent years, I've put a lot of effort into stock photography. And I've, I've built slowly a library of close to 8,000 fully processed, you know, properly processed, fully identified all the species names, all properly captioned underwater pictures. I think the main audience for that that I'm thinking about for a lot of those types of shots is the general public, typically non-diving people. And that's definitely changed my priorities when shooting again. I definitely shoot in a in a more documentary style now, you know, um, than I used to. Um, it's definitely helped my work sell much more widely to a much broader range of publications. But I think I have fallen into the same trap I did about a decade ago when I started working for magazines and became too much editorial in my photography. Um, I've become too consumed taking pictures that I know will sell well and maybe not doing enough original artistic work. But, you know, we're always changing, we're always evolving. So, I, but sometimes I do feel a bit like that kind of old rock band playing all the same greatest hits again and again um, because that's obviously what, what works for the audience. Perhaps there is an argument, and I'm talking to myself here probably more than you guys, for looking for these different, reminding yourself to shoot for these different audiences, even if they are smaller. 
and you know I, I, I don't really have the answers I guess in, in, in that um, but I definitely shoot less for other underwater photographers than I used to which has lessened the amount of innovation in my work and maybe that's something I should bring back in although I do still try and do that and I do try and create original and unusual images whenever ever I can you know, one one question I put to myself is, you know, do I still shoot for myself? And I would say yes. I would say everything I shoot for myself because I've I've learned to find the joy in doing all the shots, even you know the 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 commission model shots. I find them really satisfying because they're really difficult. So they're very much shot for myself as well because of the challenges of doing them. So the just shooting for myself doesn't work. I think I need this audience to drive my photography on. So what are the the lessons in all of this? I think most critically. Uh, I think the most critical thing in, in the whole talk is that I'd encourage everyone to make pleasing themselves the main reason for making pictures. But that satisfaction can come from lots of different places. But at the same time, I think it's important to think of that audience, not to be judged by them, but to help give your voice as a photographer a direction, a focus, a clarity of thought in your photographic decision making. Having an audience in mind can really help us make clearer, better decisions about our photography. So to come back to a, a different Ansel Adams quote, which I think sort of sums this up, is, is there's nothing worse than a, a sharp image of a fuzzy concept. And I, I think what Ansel Adams is getting at this is, you know, you've got to know what you're trying to say as a photographer. And that starts by who are you trying to say something about this subject to? Um, and that can really help give us those sharp concepts that can drive our pictures forward. And while there's no wrong audience, I think it's a mistake to always shoot for the same audience as a photographer. Trying to please diving magazine editors can make our work less artistically fulfilling, perhaps. Trying to please our peers or social media followers can make our, our work perhaps too niche in its appeal or too samey. Trying to please contest judges usually just leaves us disappointed. But they can all be satisfying in, in their own right. A little bit of everything. And they'll improve our photography and stretch our portfolio if we, 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 we take our time from time to time to shoot both. As photographers, I don't think we should ever underappreciate that audience. And we should push our photography forward to try and please, to try and please, to try and create images that they want to see. And if we do that, I think for different types of audiences, we can produce totally distinct images, even when faced with the same subject matter again and again. And I think that's really, for me, what thinking about an audience can do. It can allow me to take my photography into totally different places, even when shooting the same subject with the same lens in the same place. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope that we felt um, something um, well worth, worth hearing and something fresh and different. Um, I'm really happy to answer questions about the talk or, in fact, on, on any aspect um, of, of underwater photography. So thank you very much.